Hello and welcome to my workshop. In this video, we're going to be doing the custom waste board using the CNC alone. So that means no drill presses, no drill bits, no templates and no clamping of other boards. Just pure CNC work. For this video, I'm also going to be assuming the exact same measurements and hole diameter sizes as my previous board over there. And those are 4.7 millimeters for the bolt holes, 5.9 millimeters for the little insert attachment holes and 9.4 millimeters for the countersink. Now those measurements are converted from their imperial counterpart because it's a lot easier for me to work in a metric scale but whatever you're comfortable with use that. The steps are pretty much the same is just the units of measurement that differ. Now uh, we have our measurements and the first thing that we need to do is figure out our path. So from all my previous videos you know that the path is where the center of the cutting tool bit is going to run. And if we have any constraints the path needs to be adjusted. Now let's see what we have. Here are the hole sizes that I mentioned earlier in graphical form. Uh, we have the bolt sizes which are the 4.7 millimeters. The attachment ones are 5.9 and the countersink which is common for both is 9.4 millimeters. And the green item right here is the actual cutting tool heads or that's the diameter of the flat end mill that we're going to be using. Now the reason we're going to be using the 3.17 millimeter flat end mill is because of the constant diameter between the shank and the actual cutting tool head and that way we don't have to make any additional adjustments because of the smaller cutting edge. In addition we're going to be plunging it about two centimeters down so definitely we don't want to have any interference of the shank versus the smaller diameter. So that's why we are using the flat end mill. Now let's see what our path should be. As we know, uh, we have the constraint that this is the maximum size of a hole that we need. So that means our tool head must run along this edge without going over. Obviously because of the small size I can't really emulate it but you get the idea. So that means our tool path has to be somewhere inside here. Now the easiest way to figure out the tool path is take the diameter of the hole that you need to cut and then subtract the diameter of your tool head. Now let's see the theory in practice. Uh, our Diameter right here is 4.7 millimeters and our tool is 3.175 millimeters and the easiest way to create the desired tool path is this. So we draw the circle as usual and then for the width and height we simply do 4.7 minus 3.175. And that gives us the dimensions. Uh, you can either copy and paste right here in the height or do the exact same operation here in the height field as well. And then we lock it just in case. And that is the dimension of our two path. And now let's give it a little fill uh, just so that we can grab the center and put it on the center of the hole as well. So there it is. And now I'm going to be blowing it up a little bit right here. And let's see if the center of the tool head on the path cuts our desired line. And as we see it does. Now obviously we have to play with the width of our stroke but in this case we don't care. It, uh, what we care about is the actual tool path which is right here. So what I'm going to do now is the exact same thing for the other two holes. Okay so there we are. This is what we have. Now the other easy way to ensure proper centering of your uh, two objects is to basically select them and then go into the align and distribute functionality and use one of these and then one of these and that basically centers everything. Uh, so there you go, two ways of centering your path onto your actual hole diameter size. Now that we know what the paths look like, let's see how to put it all together to come up with our desired holes. 
Now, this is the case where I discovered something that might give you a little bit of a headache, so let's get right into it. In using the CNC, we've seen in my previous videos that you can do it two ways. One is do something that's called on the path. That means the tool just runs along the tool path that we have right here. And the other one is the called relief carving. So basically, you manipulate the grayscale to come up with two different heights. So given our uh, countersink holes, relief carving might be your first choice but that's going to give you the headache that I was mentioning earlier. Now, let's see what I mean by that. So, let's get into our, uh, let's say, attachment hole and our countersink hole. So, in our case, we want the countersink to be roughly about 50% of the height of my MDF. So, we're going to make that exactly 50% grayscale. Uh, and in Inkscape, you have that uh, button right here that could give you a 50% grayscale. Yep, there it is. Click, done. Uh, and I'm going to remove the stroke to prevent us from confusing each other. And then our uh, attachment or a bolt hole, uh, I'm just going to pick up the attachment hole. Uh, that's going to be the complete black or the complete uh, 19 millimeters of the MDF thickness. So that's our uh, the deepest portion that we can go into. So we're going to color it 100% grayscale or in this case black. Of course, we want the holes to be concentric circles. And again, we can either use the uh, center dragging along the center if you have our snapping features enabled or we can go into our uh, align and distribute and use these buttons right here. Uh, obviously, if you get something like this, you have to play with the ordering of the items. So I'm going to select the larger and then go and object and lower. And there it is. So basically, this is what we are hoping for. Now, to avoid confusion with everything else right here, let me take it and copy it into a fresh document. And there it is. That is our concentric circle right here. So, let's save this and let's move to the Luban software and see what it does. So, we've launched the Luban software and I'm going to keep the center um, of, the, uh, of the page as the origin. And let's import it right here. Loading object and let's also blow it up so that we can see properly. Okay, so we do see the two concentric circles and we have the option of a vector and relief. And we're going to be using the relief carving because we have the grayscales and there we, they are right here. Uh, of course, our uh, maximum target depth is two centimeters or 20 millimeters. And so that's going to give it enough uh, clearance to move away from the bottom of the MDF. Um, so that's why we're going to do uh, 20 millimeters as opposed to 19 point something. So it's just much easier. Uh, flat end mill and let's save the two path. Okay, so far so good. Now let's generate the G code and see what we have. Uh, four minutes, so that's pretty good per hole. Uh, but there we are seeing um, something that we may not be expecting and that is a little bit more of a conical design. I mean, that kind of looks like the Empire State Building. Oh, there it is right there. The Empire State Building kind of going in that way. So we have the fat bottom and then moving slightly to a, a narrower top. So that may not be exactly what we are looking for. And that, it, that took me a while to figure out why. And it seems like size matters. And when you get into some smaller size diameters, like what we have here, like one millimeter diameter of a hole, um, it, it doesn't, uh, the Snapmaker Luban doesn't properly handle it. Now, if we go back to the edit portion and we increase the size, of our graphic to let's say nine and a half millimeters and do the same exact relief carving we generate the g-code uh, and once we rotate we do see a lot more 
of that inner diameter that we need. But then again, it still looks like the Empire State Building with the fatter bottom and then kind of going narrower towards the top. So, relief carving doesn't work as we expect. So, can we do STL? Well, I mean, of course you can, but you're going to run into that same problem because, again, it is a relief carving. I'm going to demonstrate it because I have previously created it. So I'm going to delete the toolpath. I am going to delete the object and I am going to import the STL that I have right here. Uh, if, you, if you get an error like this, just simply click repair and click away and click once again and select the top because that's how we're looking at it. Again, the exact same thing. And again, nine and a half millimeters. If we move it to the exact hole diameter that we need, like 6.3 millimeters, and we do the path, we are going to get the exact same thing as we were seeing before. Well, in this case, we are just going to be doing the larger diameter hole and that's it. But all of a sudden, when I move it to nine and a half millimeters, which is the same amount as it was imported with, regenerate the G-code, we see exactly what we are looking for. So we can see the STL gives you much better path in terms of what we're looking for, like those sharp cutoff angles that we need for the countersink and for the actual hole uh, itself, uh, as opposed to the SVG, which kind of gave it a little bit like the funnel effect. So STL is definitely better for path, but again, it is not going to work for the smaller diameters that we need. So now it begs the question, can we actually even use the CNC alone? to create those holes? And the answer is yes. There is a little workaround and let me show you what it is. In understanding the workaround, this is what I've created. Uh, this is the bolt countersink and hole, uh, something similar to what we've seen before. Uh, I've also made the tools to be somewhat semi-transparent so that we can see where and what they cut. Now, instead of the relief carving, what if we just run the tool along the path? Now let's see what it cuts. I'm also going to blow it up a little bit for clarity. So we have the tool. So the center of my tool is running along the path and this is what it cuts. And if we run it along the uh, countersink path as well, this is what it cuts. So basically we see that there is an overlap. So what that means is if we just run the tool along the path, it cuts our circles and our holes perfectly. Okay, so let's go to the Luban software. Uh, let's delete the path, let's delete the STL file and import our original uh, custom uh, wasteboard SVG, which we know it was uh, the exact same uh, dimensions and diameter. So we're gonna be using the vector and we are going to create the tool path and now let's do the 20 millimeters that we've already done before. Once we generate the G-code, this is what we get. So based on that SVG file, which again contained two separate paths, one for the outside, one for the inside, the Luban software treats them as one. And that's why we are seeing that 20 millimeters cut on both ends. So where do we go from there? Well, we separate things. So we are going to delete temporarily uh, one of the um, paths and we're gonna save it as a custom waste board and that's countersink. And we're going to have another file where we save it as, I'm just gonna call it inner. 
So then in our Luban software, we import both and we create separate paths for those two uh, paths that we have created. So let's delete this. Let's delete the SVG as well and import our countersink and our inner. And because we use the center of the page as the uh, origin, everything is centered for us already. So we click on the inner and we know the inner is the, the deepest uh, cut that we need. We use the vector graphic and we create a tool path that is 20 millimeters in depth. And the outer or the countersink, we want it to be about halfway. So we're going to create a tool path just for the outer. And that is going to be 10 millimeters. And I'm actually going to um, rename the tool path so that we can, uh, we, we can be clear as to what is what. So countersink. And let's modify that to... Uh, inner. Now that we generate the g-code, this is exactly what we are looking for. Uh, even with the uh, small diameter of the inner hole, we still go deep inside and create that hole that we need. And of course we have our countersink, which is the outside, and that is about 50% of the actual depth. So that was the workaround, creating two separate files, one containing the path for the outside and one containing the path for the inside and kind of combining them into, into one. So they're going to be running along that same origin point. But that gives us a proper hole as opposed to trying to figure out how to make the relief carving work. And this was actually good because the hole sizes were slightly smaller and we could do that if it was something bigger. Yeah, maybe the STL or the grayscale SVG relief carving might work better. But for this particular scenario, this is the way to go. Now, let's see how to go about doing measurements of where each hole should be. And that is the most important part because if you get things wrong one way or another, uh, your whole board gets screwed up and you have to start <laughs> from scratch again. So let's see how to do it. Here is an easy method of how to find the distance between two circles that are of different diameter. The method I'm going to show you works 100% of the time. What we need is to know the distance between the outer edges of the circles. And then we subtract the radius of one circle and we subtract the radius of the other circle. Now let's see how it is in practice. So we know the diameter of this circle is 1.37 millimeters. And so what we need to do is bring the line down uh, by the radius. So 1.37 divided by 2. And that's what we get right here. Similarly, let's check. This is 2.725. And we need to bring the line up by half that amount. So, and we're going to get 2.725 divided by 2. So now we see that the line is also running through the center. And basically this is the distance between the centers. You can also do this by measuring the distance between the inner edges of the circles and then adding the respective radii. It's going to give you the exact same answer. Now let's get onto the snap maker and figure out the grid. Here is a small example of how I'm going to measure things and I'm going to apply the same methodology for the rest of the board. First I'm going to measure the diameter of the bolt head. Now they all came out of the same factory so I'm assuming they're going to have the same diameter. And then I'm going to measure the distance between each and every bolt and marking it in my paper. After that I'm going to create the grid in Inkscape. Based on the measurements of the mounting holes, or I should say the bolts, we have this pattern right here. And based on the attachment bolt pattern that we see right here, we have this pattern right here. So I'm just going to overlay it and see what we have. 
uh, and there it is we have four that overlap right here and those are these mounting bolts right here and considering they're mounting bolts in the original board i will modify the pattern a little bit later on now that we have the grid it is time to verify the measurements and we'll do that by actually using the cnc uh, we'll plunge the CNC bit inside the hole to verify the coordinates. Now, before proceeding, it's very important that you make sure that the bit is inserted but not tightened. That way the bit can retract inside in case we end up in the wrong spot. Now, let's get to it. First, we'll begin with the top left hole and make sure you adjust slowly. And then once you think it's all good, plunge in the bit little by little and make sure that it doesn't drag or it doesn't get pushed inside. Once we have clear movement, that means we have the coordinates. Once you find the coordinates of the top left hole, retract the bit and set it as the work origin by going into the set work origin menu and clicking on the set work origin button. That way we can use these coordinates on the touchpad and verify them against the XY coordinates on our SVG drawing. Now our next mark is at 117, so let's move that to 117. And there, the bit moves freely up and down inside the hole and that means we have the right coordinates for that second mark as well. Now, of course, there is a twist and let's move on to this mark right here. Uh, it is showing at positive 76 uh, millimeters on the Y axis. But when we move on to the snap maker, we can see that our Y axis is actually negative. Now, this is a little bit of a difference between the Snapmaker and the software, so you have to be careful with uh, the numbers. Uh, in my case, I'll be taking the inverse of the y-axis so that I can make sure that everything is lined up properly. Now it's time to do the CNCing, but we still have a few steps to take care of prior to turning on the machine. Number one is figuring out the waste board. And the waste board is going to be sandwiched between the new board that we're going to have on top and the metal bed we're going to have underneath. Since we'll be drilling holes that go through the new board, we don't want the bit to come out and hit the metal bed. So that's why we have this sacrificial piece in between. For this project, I'm going to be using the board that I started the series with last year. And obviously I've been using it on the drill press as well but you can also use the original Snapmaker board for this purpose. The second thing is the new waste board and just like before it is slightly elongated and just like before I have drawn pencil mark that centered the board in relation to the old one. Now the waste board will be attached to the Snapmaker bed so I may not be able to properly use the pencil marks to align it so I have a cheat way of doing so and that is using stoppers. They can be as simple as butterfly clips that I line up with the mark right here and then I slide it in until they hit the waste board that's attached to the bed. The third thing is to find the center of the Snapmaker bed and that's because the Luban software always aligns the origin with the center of the object. Allow me to demonstrate. We have the origin at the center so once we import our grid we can see that it's aligned to the center. So we have our X and Y being 0, 0 and that is technically right at the center here. If we do something obscure such as move it the origin to the bottom left and afterwards align our object with the origin, again we see that the origin is aligned to the center of the object. To easily find the center of the bed, if you still have the origin set to the first hole right here, all you have to do is go to the bottom right mark, find out its coordinates and half them. And that's going to give you the X and Y coordinates of the center of the bed. The next thing we need to figure out is the process or the steps that need to take place in order to have a successful project. And this is what we put on our machine thinking hat, which is execute commands, don't care about anything else. Now, let me give you this scenario. The current waste board is attached to the snap maker bed in the holes that are marked with a solid black line. On top of the waste board, we are going to have our new waste board attached to it. And in order to prevent it from moving, we have to use some sort of a clamping device. 
since there are no holes on the new board I'm gonna be using the C clamps at first but they are bulky so they will definitely interfere with the operation of the snap maker so the question now is how can I eliminate them as quickly as possible and this is what I thought about I am going to route all the holes that are marked with a dotted line and then I'm gonna use my oversized screws to secure the new board to the snap maker bed and prevent it from moving after that, I can drill any other hole and not worry about any interference. And the final thing we need to do is figure out the G-code and that's based on the steps that I mentioned earlier. We're gonna have three individual holes and then all the rest. The example that you see here is all the rest with the three individual holes being removed. And finally, we can put the theory into practice. Here we are at the machine, the bit is tightly tightened into the module and I ensure that the origin is at the coordinates of the top left hole and that is because it's a lot easier to navigate individual holes using the coordinate system right here. So I'm going to attach our new board and then move to the coordinates of this hole right here. So that is 234 and minus 50 or in our case, because it's the y-axis, it's gonna be plus 50 on the snap maker. This is the hole. I do need to lower the bit a little because the collet was grinding against the surface but other than that it looks okay. Now the most important thing is will it bite and will it hold on. So I'm going to be doing the quick way since I hand tightened it. there it is tight and I'll proceed with all the remaining holes right now so I'll see you once everything is ready and there you have it a brand new board and let's see how it all fits and you know it's the new board because the previous one we did in the last episode is still at the back now just like in the previous video I'm going to be looking for attaching the board using all 14 of the bolt holes and from oversize now the bolts are the correct size their comparison so I'll have a chance to tighten everything down just like in the previous video I have added all but one of the bolts so let's see how the final one fits in And there you have it, the board is perfectly attached to the bed. Now I must admit that for two of the holes I felt a little drag as I was tightening things down. So maybe my clearances were a little too tight or my coordinates were just a little off. But overall it is perfect. And let's see a few additional shots of the board and how it all looks. Let's conclude the video by talking about the good, the bad and the ugly. 
The good is we have a brand new, solid, fully functional waste board. The bad is it took upwards of 11 hours of CNCing and that doesn't include the time that I spent in figuring out whether I should use relief carving versus on the path, the time spent in figuring out the dimensions of my paths and also the distance between each hole. As you can see from this video, the CNCing was done on a layer level. So what that means is the CNCing plunged 0.6 millimeters, applied it to all holes, then plunged again 0.6 millimeters, applied it to all holes. I would have preferred if it was focusing on each hole at a time, so that way all that movement between each hole could be eliminated. Now there is a way to eliminate it, but that means you have to spend a lot more time up front by creating uh, one file or actually two files, one for inner hole, one for outer hole, for each and every position of each hole and then creating the necessary two path for it. So that's what I said, you might be spending a lot more time up front as opposed to during. So that's a trade-off you have to take a look at. And finally, the ugly. As you can see, there is a little wavy line right here and that wavy line is also present in the original board but not as pronounced. So that means I went off somewhere, either in the positioning of my object in the Luban software or finding out the center or both. But aside from that, we have a complete and functional wasteboard. If you like this video, make sure to like, share and subscribe and also hit the notification bell to get notified of my future video releases. Also, follow me on all social media channels and consider supporting me on Patreon. All the links are down in the description.